Okay, I'm going to do part two. Genesis 6 Conspiracy, part two. All right, um, that was some interesting. Um, I'm going to do another one of these questions and answers from Brian Call, and uh, we'll throw that in there. Now, let me see. We're up to page 359, and um, I'm just going to have to see what it says here. Let me see. I think that's where we left off. 359. Let me see. 383. 358. Yeah, 358. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, we finished that. We'll go to next page. Is, um, uh, all the way over the other side. 380. Okay, 380. I'm going to read 380 to 383. That's what it says. Okay. The problem with pre... <clears throat> the problem with pre-trib... That's the pre-tribulation doctrine. Is that it relies too heavily on being saved from the wrath and the introduction of the Antichrist. Prophecies without giving due consideration to the scores of companion prophecies... Combine this with a misunderstanding of the timing of the wrath of God, the defining event that decisively declares the Antichrist to the world, and we end up with an exceedingly embarrassing, excruciating, and reprehensible discrediting of the saints and mass at what will be the most crucial apex in the 6,000-year um, mandate of Adam's seed. The time of wrath does not begin until the midpoint of the seven-year tribulation period when the Antichrist seizes absolute power from the world government and destroys Babylon. Okay, see what I, I'm, th <laughs> I'm thinking that um, Babylon, in this case, Mystery Babylon, is Jerusalem because right now that's where all the, you know, Marxist New World Order is coming from. I mean, that's where it's controlled from, so... Uh, the time of the wrath. Okay. Secondly, uh, it is not the introduction of the Antichrist at the signing of the covenant of death that triggers the rapture. Rather, it is when the individual who aspires after the spirit of Antichrist achieves his status as world dictator by completing the abomination that causes desolation in the temple that triggers the rapture. Let us defer to the Apostle Paul's words in Thessalonians with regard to this matter. Connecting the coming of our Lord Jesus and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to easily become unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. Okay. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called or is worshipped so that he uh, sets himself up as God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things, and now you know what is holding him back so that he may, he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is, is already at work, but the one who now holds him back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed. The covenant signing at the beginning of the seven-year tribulation does not reveal the Antichrist. This is only the introduction to the future Antichrist, a sure sign to the end times that are here. Rather, the Antichrist will truly be revealed to the world when the restrainer of the Holy Spirit is removed from the world, permitting the prospective previously introduced Antichrist candidate to complete his mid-trib revelation with the abomination that causes desolation. Paul wrote Second Thessalonians precisely connecting the gathering of God's people, the rapture miracle with the abomination and the holy temple, which all takes place at the midpoint of the seven-year tribulation period. Note finally 
that the little wrath of God in Revelation 16 begins with the plague of sores breaking out on people who have taken the mark of the beast. The people will not be forced to take the mark of the beast until after the abomination of the image being erected in the holy temple. All this takes place after the coronation of the Antichrist at the midpoint of the tribulation. This abomination that causes desolation is the establishment and the crown, crowning of the lawless one as God in the temple of Jerusalem, which is yet to be built. This is clear in 2 Thessalonians, Daniel, and Revelation. Clearly, the abomination is the revelation of the Antichrist, not the negotiation and the signing of the covenant that will bind together the New World Order. The verses in 2 Thessalonians clearly underscore that the rapture will not occur until the Antichrist is revealed, but this revelation, according to 2 Thessalonians, will occur after the rebellion. The rebellion is the coronation of the Antichrist that causes the abomination. It is the spurious symbol for complete rebellion which unites the inhabitants of the earth against God. The consummation sign for this rebellion will be the populace and mass accepting the mark of the beast as a symbol of their covenant of allegiance, just as Nimrod attempted to do. The book of 2 Thessalonians records, defines, and reveals what will happen. The passage cannot be separated for convenience interruption, uh, excuse me, for convenient interpretation, just as the Nephilim narrative cannot be separated from the flood narrative. The revealing of the Antichrist clearly includes the rebellion, the abomination, and the mark of the beast. It is not the signing of the covenant. I clearly understand that my position is contentious among Christians, but this is also the point. Mainstream Christian believes in pre-trib rapture, and if a pre-trib rapture does not come about, they will witness a spectacular of immense and tragic proportions. In addition, achieving the covenant um, may take a series of accords, the first of which we might, may not be negotiated by Antichrist. This could cause even more humiliation of the saints, if so. The saints will slander the person who negotiates the covenant of death with unrestrained veracity in the face of world opinion, just when the people of the world at that time will be uplifting this individual as the greatest person of our time at any time. The saints will slander the Antichrist as in a cosmikaze fashion they will expect to be safeguarded from incrimination by virtue of what they will incorrectly believe to be eminent rapture. The future Antichrist, however, will be portrayed as the greatest hero in the world at that time, untouchable as far as the masses will be concerned, and yet the saints will be attacking him unceasingly as evil false messiah of prophecy. The saints will be perceived as religious fanatics intolerant to change into other races and religions. They will be declared relics who fanatically hold on to the so-called barbaric and primitive past. Others will, be, others will label them enemies of the new age, the new universal religion, and the new world order who are ferociously attacking the alleged savior of humankind. The saints will be in their most vulnerable state and poised for genocide from the new world order in Babylon. Saints will wait patiently and hopefully to be rescued from the coming genocide, but the rapture will not come for another three and one half years. Saints will be humiliated and discredited beyond understanding because of this. All will be just as prophesied. First of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is the coming he promised? Ever since our fathers died, everything has gone on as it has since the beginning of creation. Second Peter. The world will scoff at the saints, their holy promise of rapture, and at the second coming of Jesus. The saints will be utterly betrayed by the so-called moderates of Christianity, seditious and evil church-going liberals and Gnostics who have methodically worked their spurious ways into Christianity. Their vitriolic moles will then side with New World Order and the Babylonian religion of mysticism in a schism of Christianity that will make Martin Luther's Protestant movement pale in, by comparison. The world would be delirious with delight at the prospects of a utopian unified world where heaven on earth will be achieved. The people of the earth will be drunk with the uh, exhilarating excitement from the ascending uh, false messiah. Only monotheistic saints will be the uh, party poopers set steadfastly against the upside down world. The people of the earth will have no patience for negative naysaying monotheists. The saints will be vermin that must be exterminated. The state of affairs will be the catalyst to the Babylonian genocide referred to in Revelation. 
This will be the first two genocides waged in the last days against Christians and all faithful monotheists. <laughs> I know it doesn't say that anywhere, but I don't know. I mean, it doesn't say anything about, you know, faithful monotheists. I, it, remember from the, the previous show here, I was saying, <sighs> this guy <laughs> guy has some strange interpretation of the, the idea that being a monotheist is automatically put you into the kingdom of God. Such is a, a diabolical uh, genius of deception. The world will not run into the open arms of a self-declared madman and mayhem or a demoni, de, demonic dictator. The world will not suddenly go brain dead and embrace the spurious religion of Satan. The world's people will not suddenly become bloodthirsty bandits out to murder and torture the innocent who clearly shout the truth in the face of blatant evil. Instead, the world will be deluded through the cleverest of deceptions, and people will climb all over themselves with misplaced delight and fervent optimism in the pursuit of creating heaven on earth. All right. Uh, okay. Okay. I am who I am. This is what you are to say to Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. Which, by the way, didn't happen because um, the uh, Israelites did not use that name. They wouldn't even write it. You know? So, this is one of the ways they failed God. You know, God saying, "This is the name I want to be remembered by," and they didn't do it. So. Okay, um, saints will be classified as fanatical, evil cult that follows the devil, God, Ad Adonai. So, who is Adonai, and how will this Adonai be drafted to bring about the shaming of the saints? The appellation Adonai utilized for God Most High has quite a spurious historical definition. YHWH or Yahweh, Jehovah did not permit his name to be pronounced nor written, for it was too holy. So, <laughs> see, that's not true. That's exactly what he said. He just said, okay, in Exodus, this is the name I'm to be remembered by, that I'm to be known by. And then this guy says his name was um, not to be pronounce it written that's not true it didn't there's, there's nowhere in the scripture that, were they um, prohibited from pronouncing and writing his name so that's a um, um, some kind of strange myth that grew up uh, it's one of the kinds of things that you know Jesus would have condemned you know as a law of man replacing with God's but in truth God's name is unknown to humans and we would not be able to understand or pronounce his omnipotent name if we did However, some of the great tribulation will have God's true name written upon them. The name Yahweh is derived from the Old Testament uh, uh, where God stated to Moses, I am who I am, or Yahweh in Hebrew. Yahweh was a name unique to Israel and has not been discovered to be the name for a deity outside of Israel. Okay, that's true, but why, why is he saying we can't know it if it's, you know, it just doesn't make sense. Or we can't pronounce it, it's right here, I don't get it anyway. Cahill sets forth other possible definitions for Yahweh, which he believes may be a little more accurate. I am who causes things to be. Ungers notes that W.F. Elbright concluded Yahweh originated from the Northwest Semitic verb H.W.Y., meaning to be or to come into being, suggesting that the true name for the Creator ought to be He causes to be or He creates. Amorite personnel personal names after 2000 BC reflected this verb as being in vogue during that period. As legend goes, the Adonai appellation was given to God in order to circumvent the sin of writing or saying God's name. But that, that just doesn't make, <laughs> that just doesn't make sense, you know. Um, from this time um, before the time of Moses. Certainly, Jewish people did not speak the name Yahweh after 70 AD, for Jews only spoke 
his name once a year in the Holy of Holies in the Temple, the Day of Atonement. Therefore, according to Kill, Israelites always substituted Adonai even when reading Holy Scriptures. Nelson states that because Yahweh was too holy for human lips, the Jews adopted Adonai or Lord, which was better reflected in Greek translations as Lord. Adonai translates into English from Greek as Lord, meaning God. Adon is translated as Lord, while it, uh, I translates as my, forming my Lord. Originally, according to Gardner, Ad, Adon derived from the Ph Phoenician title, meaning my Lord. This accounts for Exodus permitting I am or Lord as interchangeable in the text. Okay. Uh, we are going to go to 385. Okay. Okay. As legend goes, the Adonai appellation was given to God in order to. Oh, I just read that. Whoops. Okay. I just read. Okay. Page 400. We're going to page 400. All right. One, two, three. Um, okay. All of these Gnostic groups, also known as the Albigens found imaginative methods within the innocent and pastoral confines of legend and mythological literature, including the fairy tale concept to preserve the even more ancient ring lord culture and grail bloodlines. The Roman Mother Church was perpetually allegorized as an evil stepmother witch or impious potentate. The estranged princes and princesses represented the grail ring bloodlines with the key message of appreciation for the perpetuity of the San Grail, Holy Grail. Secrets to the bloodline have been kept alive in such classic writings and legends as Robin Hood, the Holy Grail, or uh, um, Arthurian legends, fairy tales, and of course the popular land, uh, Lord of the Rings legends. Uh, this chapter and the ones that follow will provide evidence revealing a seemingly unified and determined effort to encode the genealogy and allegedly combined Jesus and Nephilim bloodline within some of the most famous pieces of children's and adult literature as a testimony to the validity of those bloodlines and with the hopes that someday the alleged descendant of Jesus will eventually regain the crown of a major European nation and later all Europe. As Lawrence Gardner put it, all grail and ring lure um, uh, Arthurian tales, Robin Hood, the mythology of Dracula, and fairy tales, including such tales as Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, Peter Pan, and others, stem from a common historical base and are all imagined in the cult, um, all ingrained in the culture of the Ring Lords. Even the Grimm fairy tales, authored by Wilhelm Grimm and Jacob Ludwig, are pantheist and Antiquarian mythologies integrated into German context and folklore, all, de all designed to advance Volkish ideology, the, and uh, that ultimately served the sinister objectives of Hitler and his pantheist reign of terror. <laughs> so, I have to laugh anytime somebody um, sort of uses Hitler as the you know ultimate evil kind of. Uh, manifestation of these ideologies because um, I just don't think that's true. I just, you know, I just don't see if you dig deeper into history that um, that that's not. In fact, I'm I'm going to be reading. I'm going to be doing a book review soon of Veronica Clark's um, translation of um, it was the um, uh, National Socialist um, writings on Freemasonry. It's very interesting. Okay. Garner goes on to write that the Ring of Lords Grail quests, in essence, are the same, and they include Tolkien's modern variations that includes fairies, elven, and magic. Uh, Ring quest is merely a parallel Grail quest. Tales of fairies, spirits, gnomes, elves, and light beings um, questing for treasures at the foot of the rainbow and uh, just as famous quests in antiquity for golden fleece, the emerald tablets and the tables of destiny are all the same figurative quest and or mythos. Um, 
400, okay. Okay. Dan Brown writes that tells about Gawain, the Green Knight, King Arthur, and Sleeping Beauty are all Grail allegories. He further notes that Victor Hugo's classic The Hunchback of Notre Dame and Mozart's Magic Flute are both Grail allegories, brimming with Masonic and Egyptian symbol. Magic Flute was a fairy tale plot. Brown writes Wagner's uh, Parsifal was a, a tribute to Mary Magdalene and that Richard Wagner, Mozart, Beethoven, Shakespeare, Gershwin, Houdini, and Walt Disney were all Freemasons. In addition, Brown adds that Walt Disney and his corporation have you know, endeavored to keep the Grail legends alive through animated productions such as Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, Snow White, Lion King, Little Mermaid, just to name a few. All are overflowing with mystical religious allegories and Im Im uh, imagery. In addition, Mark Booth writes that uh, Lewis's Narnia tale are steeped in Rosicrucian lore, while works by Rebellious, Nostradamus, Shakespeare, Wagner, and Bach are saturated with green language, legomanism, encryptions, and wisdom. Okay. The renowned merry men of Sherwood Forest were symbolic of Mary's men, Magdalene, for they served as protectors of the blind line and its conspiracy of secrecy, guarding the secrets of Jesus and his son's genealogy through Jesus' marriage to Mary. Robin, of course, represented the male inheritance of the royal bloodline in exile, while Maid Marian symbolized Mary Magdalene and the secret marriage. King John and the scurrilous sheriff of Nottingham symbolized the sherping in the holy throne by the Roman church and its sanctioned monarch, monarchies from the rightful heirs. The throne of England and Rex Deus, a legend, is the existing reigning throne of David. The Book of Rosalind documents the Gnostic Catha refugees, gypsies, Rex Deus, and Gnostic based organizations were all linked by symbolis and symbolized in Robin Hood lore, represented by uh, the varied merry men of Sherwood. Robin Hood tales were originally banned in Europe, for they mocked the accepted theology for both church and state at the time, while secreting within their conspiratorial allegories at the heart of the so-called truth to the true dynastic bloodlines of Jesus. In fact, the Presbyterian Parliament of Scotland in 1555 banned Robin Hood from being performed. It was particularly per, um, perplexed at the performing of Robin Hood at Roslyn Castle. This is why Robin Hood tales found popularity among Rex Deus families of Sinclair and the, and the Stuarts. In fact, Templar historian Stephen Sore notes Sinclair clans were known protectors of the gypsies, and the gypsies would migrate to Roslyn and play out stories of Robin Hood and the Mary, and the Mary Queen. Okay. Uh, I think I'm going to read one more of those. Um, four, okay. All right, let's see. Let's go to page 421. We're getting there. We are moving through 421. Um, <clears throat> all right. Six and seven. Okay. This ultra secret organization, in all likelihood, I think that's the Roshan Crucian or Illuminati, is the very same uh, vicious and diabolic cult at the root of the Jewish conspiracies. Even though these powerful groups have alleged Jewish genealogies connecting them back to King David, they are not the true dynastic descendants of Judah, David, and uh, Jesus. Rex Deus and its puppet organizations are dangerous rogue cult loyal to Lucifer and dark angels. They are mystics and pagans. Um, <clears throat> okay. <laughs> you know, this is funny because um, you don't really have to look to those things. Uh, to get to um, Jewish conspiracies, I mean, you can just look at Marxism. See, this is why I think that this guy confuses <laughs> so many things. Like, um, you know, he's trying to deflect attention from Marxism and 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 and, 
and put all the attention on these um, secret societies that, that uh, probably on the top of these secret societies are actually being run by the same people that um, in, you know invented Marxism. That, that's the way I would look at this. Um, Rex Deus authors are likely uh, the reticent scribes of the evil and covert protocols of the learned elders of Zion from which most of the misunderstood and misguided Jewish conspiracies originated. This subversive document first came to public light towards the end of the 19th century. It first surfaced in Russia in 1895 and then was published in newspapers twice later date. The Russian secret police published it in 1903, claiming that an ultra-secret group led by Jews and Freemasons controlled most of the world's international banking, judiciary and media, and we're bent on establishing world government. So, so he's right. I mean, the, the, um, whoever wrote this, uh, you know, letters of Zion. And, and remember, in 1903, that's when these, um, you know, Bolsheviks were really getting ready to, to um, destroy Russia. You know, and so these guys, this are, these guys would be like the truthers today on on YouTube that are getting kicked off. <laughs> and the guy who wrote this book is taking side of you know, YouTube and, and, and Facebook. Yeah. The Russian secret police published in 1903 claiming that it raided an ultra-secret group of, of Jews uh, in the media and so forth, world government, because they owned a lot of newspapers already. The protocols were further published in 1905-1906 pamphlets from a press controlled by right wing secret society called the Black Hundreds. So, <laughs> so this guy, you write this book now. Exactly. He's, he's exactly like... Um, the kind of person that is blaming, like, uh, making the alt-right look like the evil people when they're really truthers. They're looking to tell the truth. <laughs> and, oh, man. Um, the first no mention protocols came about by a daughter of a Russian general, Justin Glinka, who resided in Paris and purportedly purchased the documents from the Tsar in 1884, although the documents are believed to be much older. Uh, Glinka, according to Greer, was a theophysist and a spy for the Russian police. You know, the Russian, it's just like a Hungary today. You know, Hungary is being um, um, slandered because they want to um, prevent themselves from being taken over by this, you know, the Marxist globalist, you know. The protocol, uh, um, the protocols document was first published in a book format in 1897 by uh, Filipanov and again in 1901 by Professor Sher Sergius Nullis, Nullis in, in his book The Great Within the Small which was then put on display in the British Museum August 10th 1905 a second publication of Nullis's book was destroyed by the Russian Kerensky regime in, see in 1917 so <laughs> this is a just that's exactly what I'm saying. During the Russian rebellion, the protocols were standard reading among conservative opponents of the Bolsheviks, as, as it should have been. All other copies were further destroyed by the uh, Kerensky regime, which shot on sight anyone who passed a possessed a copy. A reporter posted in Moscow for Morning Post, a um, Mr. Marsden translated the protocol into English in 1920, and that translated... And that translation is the standard copy now available, which, by the way, I read. And the Protocols of Zion were then adopted by Hitler and National Socialism after World War One, which he should have done, which is the right thing to do. Hitler often quoted from the Protocol in his writings and speeches, and they were inserted in German textbooks at school. No doubt um, the, the future Antichrist will also rely upon and quote from their ab abominations. Well, they're not abominations. It's true, it's true information. It's accurate. It's correct. Um, and, um, and and it should be taught in our schools too. By the way, <laughs> you want to do something good for for, for for the world, you know, you should um, let them know who's controlling it. You know, you should tell the truth. See, this guy is not into that kind of truth <laughs> for some reason. Okay, uh, let's see. Four twenty-two. All oh, okay. Read that. All right, we're going to jump ahead to page 424. Uh, two or three. Okay. 
turn my background music a little bit. Okay. Let's see, page 424. The underground Templars first set their um, ambitions on creating an independent Scotland from which they then planned the creation of the United States and Brazil from secret of knowledge that they had about the continents across the Atlantic. This ambition came to fruition through the newly formed Freemason organization and its generative organization. This then explains the Sinclair obsession with the then yet undiscovered continents and shed light on the formidable influence Freemason organizations flexed and still flex over both Brazil and the United States. And the Sinclair a support of Columbus's mission also explains why the explorer ship carried Templar flag. Well, okay, now, okay, now he's getting in the area where I agree with him. Okay, this most of this next passage, I'm pretty much in agreement with this guy. So, the United States was founded on Templar belief of a new Atlantis, and the golden age had once existed in the ancient past and will rise once more in the new age of light. And to this end, Hancock and Bolval note that Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Paine, George Washington co collectively toiled to create a new utopian city, Washington City, for this new Atlantis, which contained esoteric allegories in its construction to Freemasonry uh, and its ancient history. In fact, uh, Marcus de la Lafayette presented George Washington with a Masonic apron that contained the all-seeing eye, 1793, during the laying of the cornerstone seminary uh, ceremony for the future Washington City. King Robert the Bruce was rewarded with his Templar patronage at um, Ban Bannockburn in 1314. Templars trained the Scots in preparation for the inevitable war against the English King Edward II. Templar gold exported from France was utilized to purchase arms from Ireland uh, and the um, Dalrida kingship of Tar. Okay, now am I supposed to be reading this? Let me see. I think I'm kind of getting... All right, well, there's, there's better stuff to read. Okay, let's move on. Um, 451. 451. Okay. Ah, let's see here. Where are we? Okay. Um... All right, 451, four, okay. Later in the book of Acts, James appears to be the church leader. When we arrived in Jerusalem, the brothers received us warmly. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James and all the elders were present. The book of Galatians recognized James as a pillar of the city of the early church, as did Peter and Paul, who submitted to James's authority. James was the author of the epistle bearing his name in the New Testament, again demonstrating the importance of James in the early church. Additionally, it was James who endeavored to ensue Gentile Christianity would not overwhelm Judaic Christianity with their numbers, but fell due to his death and the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD to the Romans. Well, that's really interesting. I, I, the guy's kind of showing where um, these early um, I guess the Gnostics were trying to kind of separate um, James for some reason. I, um, I think that has something to do with, you know, the genealogies. Okay, so um, page 456, we we'll jump ahead to 456. All right. <clears throat> okay. One, two... Let's see, four, three. Ireland is additionally the land where the lost 11 tribes of Israel were whispered to have migrated after the defeat at the hands of the Assyrians around 721 BC. Okay. Um, Ireland, too, was the land of Barak, scribed to Jeremiah, took Timar, also called Tamar, Timhar, Tara, and Tamar, Tephi. They were very famous daughters of Zedekiah, last king of Judah, after Judah's defeat and exile at the hands of the Babylonians around 589 BC. It would have been illogical for Jeremiah to replant the surviving direct matriarchy of 
and Davidic dynasty of Judah with their kin, the lost tribes of the northern kingdom of Israel. All of Zedekiah's sons were murdered by King Nebuchadnezzar, leaving only daughters to carry on the royal bloodline of David and the messianic promise through Zedekiah. As the legends go, and as the scripture records, God promised to always have someone sitting on the royal throne in the messianic kingship spawned by David. Tamar, daughter of Zedekiah, according to various legends, was transplanted to Ireland to maintain the everlasting pure dynastic royal bloodlines of the Messiah by intermarrying with descendants from the lost tribe of Israel that had migrated there after 721 BC, and also into bloodlines of descendants of Skoda, who also claim Israelite and Scythian descent. This then fulfilled the promise to always maintain a seed of David on the throne of David, albeit a transplanted throne in the exact manner that the prophet Jeremiah had prophesied in the passage introducing this chapter. The daughters of Zedekiah were recorded as surviving the Babylonian genocide via an Ishmael, who was also of royal blood. Okay, let me see. 56. Okay. All right. All right, four. Okay, we're going to go up to 466 now. Okay. Um, okay. Shakespeare was influenced by Ovid, the opulent Roman poet, circa 42 BC to 16 AD. Ovid was the author of 250 stories of Greek and Roman mythology that included these Nephilim descriptions. Uh, Diocalon and Pyritha, Pathion, Theosis, Hercules, Adonis, Orphus, Ovid, further authored Herodotus, the love letters of the woman of the heroic age to their, uh, he says in parentheses, Nephilim lovers or husbands. Augustus expelled Ovid from Rome after he completed his opus, Metamorphosis, a collection of stories that knitted together tales of the beginning with primeval chaos, early prehistoric life, the Titan Rebellion, and a Caesar transforming into a star, just as Osiris did. None of this is a coincidence. Um, okay, four, <clears throat> now I'm not sure. Why I read that? <laughs> okay, let's keep going. That just gives you a good idea of what's in the book. Okay, let's see here. 486. Um, yeah, two and three, okay. Freemason was established by Rex Deus organizations to be legions of blind agents released into the world as canker worms, creating and exporting rebellion and chaos through liberty, equality, and fraternity. Rex Deus refers to these subservient orders as Gentile masonry that blindly serve them in furthering their seditious objectives while keeping the true Rex Deus objective hidden from most Freemasons. Liberalism and its legomen green language of liberty, equality, fraternity, or Masonic words, notions reserved for the manipulated lower brethren. The learned elders are the true enlightened adepts, refer to their manipulated moles as liberal utopian dreamers that will be revealed as such once world government has been achieved. These naive dreamers will be arrested and then executed by the Antichrist when he seizes power as enemies of the new state. In a manner similar to the way Nazis moved against the communists, pacifists, and democrats in 1933. Even though the Nazis only slaughtered Jews in mass, which is, you know, I, I, it's just not true. Okay, many communities, pacifists, Democrats, died in concentration camps, likely would have been slaughtered by the Nazis given time, just as the Nazis would have turned on Christians. Well, that's, I don't know, I don't believe any of that's true in terms of um, the Nazis and Christians. Wait till I read this book that um, Veronica Clark um, translated, and you'll see what they were actually thinking, and it's not like this. Uh, everywhere this guy is injecting Nazism, Hitler, he should be putting, you know, Stalin, Lenin, and Marx. 
<laughs> that's really what happened. Uh, this idea that we were taught growing up, you know, the that the, the, um, the, the Nazis were, you know, like uh, Hitler woke up one day and decided, oh, I know what I'll do. I think I'll kill all the Jews. You know what I mean? It's like it's a totally, <laughs> totally unrelated to any previous history or anything that was going on at the time. It's just an arbitrary hatred or something. Um, first of all, most of the thing was to get, okay, they were to be uh, expelled, you know, peacefully, and there are even Jewish historians who tell you that um, Hitler, when they were confiscating property from Jews, they were sending it to Israel. Hitler was a Zionist. He was trying to get a, a place for the Israelis to go, uh, you know, the Jewish people to go when, when, when they got kicked out. Um, and they were getting kicked out because of they were pro-Marxists. And there's nothing wrong with kicking out pro-Marxists. I, I think that the whole thing was to totally legitimate. I, have no, I don't have a problem with it because I don't believe the history we were taught. Okay, anyways, um, Rex Deus established an army of Masonic lodges around the world that were and are led by adepts and the elders bent on establishing world government. Business people and important leaders were recruited en masse and rewarded from the public troth for their participation. To this end, Freemasonry played an active role in each of the American and French rebellions. For both nations played an important early role in Freemasonry's ultimate goal. In truth, the French Revolution was thought by many historians, according to Wilson, to have been an Illuminati conspiracy to place uh, Duke de um, Orléans, an Illuminati member, on the throne of France, while America was created as a model to the world of world government. According to historian Bernard uh, Fay, the French Rebellion was both funded and led by a subversive class of French no nobility that included Duc de Orleans, Marabou, Noah uh, Noah Ailes, Le Rochefort, the famous Boolean of Templar, Rex Duis, and the Lafayette families. Documents discovered in France in 1897, the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion, purportedly published by uh, Learned Elders of Zion, took credit. For starting French Revolution, remember the French Revolution, um, the secrets uh, of the um, preparation were all known to us for it was entirely the work of our hands. Okay, that's what the Freemasons were saying. See, that this is a, this is what I'm, uh, I'm always telling people. America is the original New World Order nation. That was the whole idea. This, you know, the whole melting pot and all that. This is... Um, now the um, most of the Ameri you know the most American people were fooled by this in, in, in thinking that um, you know it was about you know freedom <laughs> you know uh, but the idea was you know you're going to start a free Masonic New World Order um, a nation and it's populated by Christians you got to you got to fool the Christians and be, you need them there because they got to pay for us you know they got to pay for the thing you know they. Uh, okay, so I do agree with him. And I agree about this. The thesis of the American Revolution was having the influence by Freemason is a well-accepted theory according to Boval and Hancock, but what is not so well known is that the American lodges held very close ties to the French lodges, and both nations, clandestine Freemasonry organizations, um, kindled the idea of world government through rebellion, thus endeavoring to bring their subversive government, bloodlines, and religion to absolute power. One must understand that the form um, that f from the inception Freemasonry vowed to bring about New World Order. In the spirit of the dreams of their founders, the Knights Templar, the famous Scottish-American patriot Ar Andrew K Carnegie noted America was Scotland realized beyond the seas. Okay, 47. You know, this is really interesting. I, I <laughs> let me. Um, I guess I keep reading this. It's a pretty interesting page. Um, an early organization of Freemasonry in America was the Quest, which was formed sometime between 1625 and 1675. Benjamin Franklin was a member and self-professed Freemason, just as numerous Freemasons contributed significantly to the American Revolution. 
Granite Lodge was established in 1717, but the earliest surviving records are from Philadelphia, New York's Lodge of the 1730s, according to Freemason and author Ian Grittens. The first official charter was issued in 1733 to the St. John's Lodge of Boston that met at the Green Dragon Tavern. Freemasonry spread in America mostly through the military lodges, and by 1775 it held large sway over the ranking gentry and officers, including George Washington. In the midst of the rising rebellious tide were two influential secret societies, both with direct ties to Freemasonry, the Sons of Liberty and the Committee on Correspondence, who organized unrest among the 13 colonies. Both organizations were well represented at the Continental Congress during the war, the Constitutional Convention that followed, and the fledgling government thereafter. Okay, knowing these facts is, it helps in understanding why America is inundated with Masonic icons and its structures as a model for world government. America is a microcosm for the structure of the New World Order, with one federal government speaking for many independent states that are united in free trade, crowned um, with one leader. The federal government is assigned the role of foreign affairs, the military, and matters that affect all citizens, such as the environment, health care, welfare, and more, all with um, appropriate taxation levies to fund these port uh, portfolios. Now, this is why I'm saying, you know, we, we, we don't need, we need to secede and get rid of the federal government. Okay. And, um, yeah, Benjamin Franklin, uh, somewhere, and I can't find the quote, I think it was in, I'm pretty sure it was in Carol Quigley's um, book, um, whatever that thing was called, I forget that, Carol Quigley's real thick book that I did, I think, Tragedy and Hope. I'm almost positive that's where I find the, 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 um, the quote of Franklin um, suggesting that um, what's to come is a global scientist scientocracy, uh, a global government based on science, you know, that was, uh, and he, he, he promoted that, prophesied it, promoted it. Okay. Uh, 487 to 5 again. Uh, yeah, Franklin was initiated in February 1731, becoming a master of the St. John Lodge of Philadelphia. Okay. Um, Washington was initiated in Freemasonry in 1752. Fredericksburg, he became honorary Grand Master of the Alexandria Lodge, Washington. Um, okay, let's see here. Page 488. Let me see. Okay, let's go to 496. We'll jump ahead a little bit. Okay. I might be skipping some interesting stuff. I just didn't reread this. This is just my original notes. I don't know. I probably should have read, read, but I don't have time. It's a 690, almost a 700-page book. All right, let's see here. Um, four, uh, what did I say? I'm going to jump ahead to 496. Three, okay. In the pursuit of world government, Freemasons will keep sacred as key to their utopian doctrine the notion of destroying both the right to own private property and the right to worship the true God. Furthermore, Freemasonry's end is to prevent the right to set up a government based on the protection of man's God-given rights to life, liberty, and property. Freemasonry will seek to obtain equality through community of all goods and the destruction of all rank and property through progressive socialism. The coming world government will be characterized by tolerating only the future harlot religion of Babel, it will not be based on the rights of the individual, but rather on collective rights as defined by the harlot religion. No one will have the right to own any form of property in um, subordination of the many to, to which all belong. Uh, this coming utopian New World Order is indispensable for the harmonic convergence to collect the divine spark that is elemental for ascension into godhood for the purported chosen descendants of Nephilim. This is what uh, is known as collective salvation, the end game of l liberation theology. Um, yeah, this is um, <laughs> really interesting. I think that, um, you know, look at um, E Pluribus Unum, for instance, you know. What does that do to your, you know, if you're a, a, a believer in a true God and so forth, you know, you can't do E Pluribus Unum, <laughs> you know. 
it just doesn't work it's not open to you it's not it's not a viable option you know you can't remain um, you can't remain loyal to your God and at the same time you know turn your back on him I mean that's almost what is required uh, consider this the world nation is an accepted expression analogous to state one could easily substitute state with national to form national capitalism and not just um, adjust the meaning or intent in any way Hitler's fascist Nazi regime was totalitarian state sponsored capitalism that merged with national socialism which sustained an unaccountable blood oath against m monotheism and inexplicable blood fever to create a new man. I do not find this to be a coincidence. The end times will host new global Nazi regime and led by a new Fuhrer promising utopian millennium which will lead a new, a new world war and a new holocaust and the end of the box. Well, okay, let's, let's see where we're going now with this because um, what he's saying about Hitler is not true. So, you know, you really can't count that. Although, I think what I think what he's trying to say, and, and he can't say it because it's politically incorrect. Though that, okay, the Marxists control the New World Order right now. Um, and 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 this is where okay, this is where I'm going to start converging with with in agreement with these guys. That, okay, the uh, Marxists own the New World Order right now. In order to throw them off, you need a strong man like Hitler. And that's what Hitler was doing, and, and and so this new strong man will come along, and he will throw off the Marxist, you know, the whole Marxist control that they have, the grip on the on the modern world that they have right now, uh, which is a good thing. But then I, I believe, you know, he's going to go too far, and it's going to turn into, you know, not just, you know, I mean, you see, Hitler had. His plans were to have a place for the Israelis to have their own ethnic state, you know, Israel. And he was all right with that. But I think this new guy is going to want to destroy Israel. And that's, that's the biblical prophecy where, the, you know, he's get the catalyst to um, push the Jews into a position of between a rock and hard place. Or if you prefer, you know, between the um, Red Sea and the Egyptian army. So they got nowhere to go. They got to trust in God. Now, this is going to be the catalyst to cause them to call out to Jesus as their Savior. Um, um, there are a lot of a lot of Jews in Israel that believe in Jesus already. So I think this is what's going to happen. Personally, that's my my interpretation of this end time event. That um, um, the Bible, many of the um, um, allusions in the Bible to this idea that the Jews, the leadership of Israel, originally rejected Jesus, and the day is going to come when the leadership of Israel will, will accept him. That, that's going to be part. That has to happen. Okay, so how it happens is, you know, is what studying prophecy is all about, I suppose, in the end times here. Um, okay, so. Uh, all right. The new apocalypse. Okay, this is 497. We're moving on to 504. Okay. And 504 says um, to the Rothschilds replaced the Templars as the first corporate financial giant of medieval Europe. They funded the Rex Deus agenda just as the Templars did. The Rothschilds grew obvious, just as the Templars did by funding European wars, likely instigated by Rex Deus, and by using loans to manipulate monarchs for their own agenda. By the time the Rothschilds juggernaut got rolling, the Rothschilds had managed to um, in, in debt all the royal houses of Europe to them including the famous Habsburg dynasty. Security for the secret end time agenda of Rex Deus was assured for Rothschild bloodlines are also Rex Deus 
as testified by London banker David Rothschild, as he claims to be a descendant of Jesus, according to Hancock. Okay, so now this is where this guy can no longer continue to uh, turn a blind eye to um, a Jewish control of the world. <laughs> you know, um, and he doesn't mention that Rothschild is Jewish. Uh, it does say he was descended from Jesus. So, I mean, Jesus was obviously Jewish. But he, he doesn't really, you know, he, he still stays away from this, the JQ, um, for whatever reason. I mean, Jesus didn't stay away from the JQ. You know, <laughs> the apostles didn't. Of course, they got killed for it. But... The Rothschild family originated with um, Mayor Armschel Bauer, a Jewish-German individual born February 23, 1744, in Frankfurt. Mayor was the court financial agent to William the Ninth, the royal administer, administrator for the Hesch um, Kaschel province, a prominent Freemason. Later, Mayer added the royal German family of Thurn and Taxis, the powerful family that established the first commercial post and courier companies in Europe as their um, uh, clientele before entering into banking. Through these first innocuous entries into the royal houses of Europe, Bauer proposed because of the inside information he received from his well-connected patrons with regard to market trends, futures and commodities, prices, and forthcoming political events. Bauer opened his first bank, Frankfurt. His son, Nathan, established the London Bank. The younger son, Jacob, established the Paris Bank. By 1811, the Bauer family formally changed its name to Rothschild, meaning Red Shield, and is likely insignia for Rosicrucian cause upon Nathan's arrival in London to uh, distance itself from anti-Semitism. While in London, Nathan purposefully established a stable of wealthy covert agents to operate their far-reaching operations. Now, this is interesting the way he puts this. Okay, so they, they change the name the Rothschilds to to distance himself from anti-Semitism or from being controlled by them. You see what I mean? It's it's you can't say you can't say that not wanting to be controlled by by world bankers is anti-Semitic. Uh, and this is the you know, this is the mistake that you get all over the place now, you know. Okay. All right. This goes on, and this is pretty interesting here. But, but by the way, this this term of this Rex Deus is um, the God Kings, and, and and he's saying that this God Kings thing all um, kind of originated um, um, back in the time of the Nephilim, and it's coming right through. And he's he says all these world leaders are uh, seek to identify themselves with this this lineage. I, I you know. Uh, I don't know why that's valuable, but, you know, um, this diabolical concept establishing strategic stables of wealthy agents by the learned elders has many covert ten tentacles into all aspects of life. Freemasonry acts to assure all governments perform as puppets to install its secret plan, appointing only fellows to the government agencies and departments. This includes presidents. They ruthlessly blackmail all those who do not respond as puppets. Freemasonry further ensures that their agents control all police agencies of the world. Other agents utilize liberalism, liberty, freedom, covert fraternities to blind society. They diligently degrade society which de uh, degenerate with degenerate doctrines, various immoralities, alcohol, and other vices. I should add drugs and uh, opium, right? Far-reaching operations began with the strategic alliances and with influential families that exist to this day. In 1814, the Rothschilds established formative business ties with Warburgs of Hamburg, Germany. In 1785, they established close ties with the Schiff family. Jacob Henry Schiff immigrated to America in 1865, joining Abraham Kuhn's investment firm. Jacob married the daughter of Solomon Loeb. The head of Kuhn Loeb and Company of New York in 1875, Jacob Schiff was promoted to the head of Kuhn Loeb in 1885 with the death of Solomon Loeb. Solomon Loeb uh, and Abraham Kuhn married each other's sisters. Felix Warburg married Jacob Schiff's daughter, 
Frida, Paul, Felix, Warburg's brother, Mary Solomon, Loeb's daughter, Nina from Loeb's second wife, Otto Kahn, another partner in, in Kuhn, uh, uh, Kuhn and Loeb, married one of the original investors at Goldman Sachs and Company. The two of the Sachs sons married two Goldman daughters. Oh, by the way, I gotta write this page down. I didn't even <laughs> write this page down for some reason. Uh, okay. Well, I didn't even write that page down on my notes. I, 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 I would have. I just skipped it for some reason. I, I, um, these families were and are still prominent in American fi finances. It is important to appreciate the great lengths these families went to in order to keep the wealth and control within a close circle of strategically aligned families. All in the Rex Deus uh, Gnostic spirit of genealogies, which all operated as extended arms of the Rothschild Empire, the covert stable agents we discussed. See, and that's why I'm saying why this guy can you, you can't continue to hide from who's really controlling this at this time. Um, the power of um, the Rothschilds empire continued to reach across the Atlantic into America where the Rothschilds funded a, a company in its infancy, Standard Oil, the family that owned and still maintains controlling interests in Standard Oil is the American powerhouse of Rockefeller. The Rockefeller em empire, because of this, according to uh, Gary Carr, owns its wealth and loyalty and power to the Rothschilds. And by the way, they, they merged their, their money a while back. And, um, and the Rockefellers, you know, Rockefeller converted to um, Protestants, some, uh, I think Baptist maybe, some, some kind of, um, you know, overt Protestant. And um, he was um, genetically Jewish. You know, so at any rate, and I, you know, he did that for he did that for political reasons. I, I really don't see him as a follower of Jesus in any way. You know, um, okay. Working through Wall Street and the strategic partners, Kuhn Loeb and Company, along with J.P. Morgan, the Rothschilds financed J.D. Rockefeller through the City Bank of Cleveland, a branch of the Rockefeller Empires, uh, so that uh, Rothschilds Empire, so that he could create Standard Oil. Uh, the Rockefellers are renowned globalists and masons. Today, the Rockefellers control four of the top seven of the world's largest oil companies that include Exxon, Standard Oil, Chevron, Mobil, Phillips 66, Marathon, Texaco, and further control 321 other oil companies. Similarly, the Rothschilds finance Edward Harriman, Union Pacific Railroad, and Andrew Carnegie, U.S. Steel. Carnegie Scott made his first fortune in um, a partnership with George Pullman, Pullman Cars, who sold railroad cars to the railroad companies. One wonders then about the uh, connection at this junction to Edward Harriman of Union Pacific with Carnegie's first enterprise. Carnegie then collected a consortium of Scots in Pittsburgh that brought up most of the existing steel companies, forming Carnegie Steel, which later became U.S. Steel and all was funded by the Rothschilds and the um, stable agents. Now, I mean, look, the same thing's happening now with uh, the Internet. You know, Google, Alphabet, Facebook, um, you know, YouTube. Um, that's the next thing they're gob gobbling up is going to be, you know, <laughs> anything to do with the information industry or something. Carnegie still then, not coincidentally, became the quintessential prototype of the modern industrial corporation, controlling every aspect of production as a completely and fully integrated and uh, integrated and vertically integrated business. Carnegie still also introduced the concept of economics of scale and production. John Rockefeller learned, adopted, and applied these concepts with Standard Oil. Carnegie still was sold in 1901 to none other than the famous J.P. Morgan, and Carnegie's proceeds were 300 million tax-free dollars in 1901. <laughs> Man, <clears throat> wow. J.P. Morgan Company, uh, too, held an important partnership with the Rothschild Empire. The Morgan family held great ties to the British Rothschilds and therefore became covert agents for them. The Rothschilds preferred to operate anonymously through J.P. Morgan Company in America as well as through Kuhn and Loeb and Goldman Sachs Company. 
Even today, the Morgan legacy has tentacles holding enormous sway in both business and political theaters. Morgan employees hold large membership in the, in the diverse collection of secret societies of today. As Morgan leadership swayed, they um, were replaced by Rockefeller family as the dominant financial political force. The Rothschilds working through Rockefellers and Morgans have gained a stranglehold on American corporations and power. All who will this power for globalist purpose, just as Rothschilds were able to do in Europe. The Rockefeller Morgan Rothschilds Axis created a powerful corporate juggernaut that is unrivaled in the world today, all working resolutely for Rex Deus' agenda. Let us now briefly explore the globalist agenda funded and nurtured by the Rockefellers, Morgans, and Rothschilds. Taking the control out of the hands of the people and their governments so that an elite group of potentates can perpetuate power through a manageable decade of puppet governments. It is a, a cornerstone of globalist doctrine. Globalists intend to provide a thin veneer of democracy under which a privileged core of potentates will dictate world policy just as they intend to provide a similar thin veneer of global free market capitalism where another predetermined core group of corporations controlled by adepts will flourish as oligopolies within the varied industries, progressive state sponsored and corporate partnered socialism. And then he goes on to introduce Hitler again. <laughs> so forget about it. I'm not even going to bother it. That's a, that's a, He's got to be talking about Marxism. He hasn't talked. See, I am. I don't. He hasn't mentioned Stalin, Lenin, Marx in this book. Instead, he keeps throwing Hitler in here. It's very strange. Very bizarre. Uh, this uh, and, and but you know they have the thing democracy now. For instance, you know this whole thing making the world safe for democracy really you know just means making the world controllable by the Rothschilds. This is why we see democracies espousing poorly applied physical conservatism partnered with public socialism on social issues. The new Atlantis will be a world des designed to reflect it. the antediluvian organizational model whereby the rich, powerful elites of society, the adepts will guard and hold most of the wealth, power, and knowledge through control of both powerful oligarchies and governments for their own self-interests. These greedy, power-hungry adepts cloak their agenda under a veil of religious allegories and economic socialism that they distribute as opium for the mundane, ignorant, unworthy masses. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Um, okay, we're going to keep reading. we got pages and pages of this stuff because it's really interesting. Uh, Masonic Rex Deus forces do not care whether the government is democratic or dictatorship, for they will and do control both generally through economic levers in the form of money lent to des desperate governments. Rex Deus then imposes their own unique form of social engineering, partnered with physical conservatism designed to enhance and further their ultimate goals of free trade and globalism. The desperate globalist groups operate collectively from a predetermined vision, digitally dictated from a cohesive assembly of adepts, which has been identified with many powerful organizations, including New World Order, the Committee of 300, the Illuminati, and Secret Brotherhood. Some believe this powerful occultist assembly of adepts is guided by non-human intelligences described as prison wardens or custodians, spiritual guides, demons, or fallen angels and or aliens. All this is consistent with the testimony from the Russian Crucians, the most illuminated of Freemasonry, and the Illuminati who secretly plot and coordinate all this sedition, for they also converse regularly with spirit guides, whom they secretly recognize as fallen angels and demons. And let us not forget the New Age and the theosophical religious leaders who regularly converse with their superhuman spirit guides, the avatars. The boldest gambit to date in the march to globalism has been the usurping of the power levers controlling economic prosperity. By this I mean the establishment of the Federal Reserve Bank, central banks of the great Western economics in tandem with the World Bank, partnered with International Mo Monetary Fund, all are dominated, manipulated, and controlled by Masonic Rex Deus globalist forces. The central banks of the world, not the elected governments, now control economic policy. One should note 
with particular re relevance, the first act of Tony Blair and his Labour government in Britain was to establish the Central Bank of England, thereby relinquishing Britain's economic control levers, the last bastion of common sense among European government, the Western governments. The IMF, the World Bank, both perpetuate a sinister strategy over the poorer nations of the world. These organizations lend countries money until they have all but um, brought the poorer countries to economic ruin, like drug dealers and pimps. First, they irrevocably addict the victim on the credit and narcotic, and s ensuring those nations are a completely dependent are completely uh, dependent for their survival upon the continuation of credit being granted, for they are no longer able to manage their debt or their enormous interest charges associated with it. Then these globalist pimps impose their will on the dependent victims, manipulating and coercing them into whatever globalist policies are in vogue at the time for the fear of being cut off from the supply of credit. One might correctly surmise, uh, by the way, you know, you probably read that book, or um, um, The um, Economic Hitman. I think it was John Portman, I think his name is. Um, I've, I've done a book review on that somewhere in my YouTube. If it's not, I'll bring it back. It's, it's, it's my files. One might correctly surmise the globalist money supply um, simultaneously addicted the great Western nations in a similar manner through the ill-advised deficit financing of their budgets in the 70s and 80s, and once more in the wake of the 2008 global meltdown, physical conservatism will once more be imposed alongside global socialism for fear that the debt bonds will not be renewed unless the debt-ridden nations capitulate to the globalist agenda. All this is yet another tentacle of the Rex Deus conspiracy. Rex Deus members surround themselves with the best educated economics, bankers, industrialists, capitalists, all educated at special elitist universities, and have, over many centuries, gained control over most of the world's wealth. The money is then lent to governments and capitalists who become their economic slaves as they cannot pay it back, thereby bankrupting many nations, all to enforce their loyalty. All this was perfected in the um, 20th century through covertly funded central banks that control the world's money supply. Does anyone really believe that any of the state um, provincial or federal governments really have any say over their economic policies, including trade? The answer, of course, is no. All such policies dictated and controlled by the powerful globalists. This is why it matters not today what party or leader is in power, for their economic policies are identical for all practical applications. Because of their debts, governments take their marching orders and policy orders from those who control the money. If debt is not enough to control government policy, then complete infiltration of government at all levels by Masons and other globalists ensures the spurious will is carried out. The most powerful potentates who included the Rothschilds, Morgans, the Rockefellers back the, gold, back the globalists. This is why politicians run on one set of pastoral principles in the platforms and adroitly implement different doctrines and policies as soon as they reach power. One only needs to look at Bill Clinton, Jean uh, Chartrain, uh, with respect to NAFTA and free trade as proof. I, was it, um, I guess somebody in um, the Canadian government, I think? Yeah. Among the first of these spurious globalist institutions was the Federal Reserve in America. This most important bastion of Western economic leadership was established through persistent efforts by illuminated, illuminated Freemasonry in partnership with the Rothschilds, Rockefeller, Morgan Axis. The Morgans worked closely with the Rockefellers to conceive the founding of the banking cartel. They did this in a secret meeting held in 1910 at J.P. Morgan's private resort on the island off the coast of Georgia. Their subversive efforts paid off with the suspicious passing of the enactment for the Federal Reserve Bank Act while opposing congressmen had already adjourned for the Christmas holiday season, ensuring European Illuminists a permanent role in America's finances and its de facto economic destiny. Not many know that the United States Federal Reserve Bank is privately owned, for this fact is kept relatively secret. Most believe the Federal Reserve is government-owned, government-directed, but it is not. It is a private corporation held by stockholders whose names are kept secret uh, through the Federal Reserve Act. <laughs> However, it has come to light that the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers are most important influential stockholders to the Federal Reserve. 
the top polls, uh, uh, eight shareholders of the Federal Reserve are an intriguing cluster of strategic covert partners. First, there is the Rothschild Bank of London in Berlin. Then there is, um, and Berlin. And then there is the uh, Lazard brothers who own Bank of Paris. Next, we have Israel Moses Sif Banks of Italy, followed by Warburg Bank of Hamburg in Amsterdam, whom the Rothschilds are partners with. Uh, we then have the Lehman Brothers, who used to own Bank of New York, as well as the Kuhn Loeb Banks of New York, who also have the Rothschilds partners. And of course, we must not overlook Chase Manhattan Bank of New York, which is owned by the Rockefellers and has merged with Citibank. Finally, there is Goldman Sachs Bank of New York. Expect that the Lehman Brothers will emerge, reorganize from bankruptcy as a powerful Phoenix company, or that they will remain in parts within one of these powerful banks. One can only interpret this institution through the lens of its powerful capitalist shareholders, all strategically aligned for hundreds of years as giant globalist leviathan bent on biased globalist policies. The other central banks of the world um, contain the same sorts of shareholders. To this globalist end, governments have been coerced by the banking cartel into sharing, uh, sheltering enormous wealth created by bank profits through the establishment of seditious tax-exempt foundations. Profits from the globalist banks are laundered into them, where they are in turn invested into other corporations that will further influence the globalist economy. By this diabolical scheme, an elite few capitalist potentates at depths increasingly influence and manipulate the global economy just as the so-called think tanks, also created by the same globalist forces, influence the opinions of the general public Private foundations, complete with uh, requisite laws, serve as tax shelters for the enormous wealth of the international banking cartel controlled by Rex Deus and the Rockefeller families, all, uh, Rothschild families. All to fund world government, the power of the Rockefellers, Warburg, Schiff's, Morgans has now shifted to the giant global foundations. And by the way, they also control the culture. They control the culture because they have all the newspapers, all the televisions, all the movie making, all the school systems, and so forth. All right. Um, okay, let's see here. How, f how far did we go so far? Um, <laughs> probably, I'm probably going to have to make a third part, but let, let's just keep going with this. Because uh, it's, um, okay. Page 521. Okay, we're going to skip ahead a little bit. 521, 512. One who rises to the level of perfection, complete enlightenment, is recognized as an adept. This title is awarded to fellows of the secret order within the innermost circles of Masonic hierarchy, the Illuminati. Only adepts, illuminated Masons, know the true secrets. They belong to both Freemasonry and Illuminati organizations. Remember, the enlightened ones, the adepts, have been completely initiated into the secret teachings of light bearer Lucifer, early 20th century writers such as uh, Nesta Webster and Augustin de Berul, a Jesuit priest, argued that the Illuminati were merely pawns in a larger game manipulated by Jewish Satanists. The Illuminati then report directly to the authentic princes of masonry, the Jewish Satanists of Rex Deus. Okay, um, 522, do I keep going? Let me see. Yeah. Wow. Okay, hence the princes of masonry comprise the foremost inner circle of the Illuminati and Roshan Crucianism. Heredity, Rex Deus, adepts are purposefully selected from within the dynastic inheritance bloodlines passed down the generations from father to son. The chosen are brainwashed from childhood to ensure full comprehension of the secret knowledge, religion, and seditious objectives. The true knowledge and doctrines are kept from all outside the chosen bloodlines, no matter how talented, how rich, or how powerful uh, they are considered unfit to receive this knowledge. And by the way, you know, um, what I was saying before, uh, you know, th this, what he's just pointing out here, and what he said about the bankers and everything, you know, that could be considered anti-Semitic, you know. <laughs> Conspiracy theories claim the order's secret 
adepts are funded by 13 families, including the Rothschilds, all who regarded as human gods, plotting world government for thousands of years. This plot is scheduled to culminate in the next few decades. The alleged Rex Deus genius adepts are mentored from childhood to rule the world, utilizing Masonic soldiers and other organizations. Thus, Freemasonry was co-opted to bring about the Illuminati agenda. I don't know if you'd say it was co-opted. That the, <laughs> God describes Freemasons as soldiers of the new religion, led by adepts who are led by bona fide super adepts of Rex Deus. Only Rex Deus adepts will be permitted to reign because only they have the true understanding and wisdom. Below the 13 families is the representative council of 33, the great Druid Council, followed by the committee of 300, consisting of Illuminati, illuminated Freemasons. All are, were linked to the elders of Zion in the um, assassinated German Jewish industrialist Walter Rathenau's book, Kriegsführung und Politik and to other modern conspiracy advocates, Rathenau is thought to have defected from elders of Zion. Well, that sounds about right. They would kill somebody like that. Common, pro, pro, common propaganda promoted by governments, universities, and elite organizations is that the Illuminati became extinct within the confines of Freemasonry, but this is not true, for the Illuminati is thriving at the innermost center just as it is in the Council of Foreign Relations, Skull and Bones. The BBC reported in November 84 that the famous British philanthropist and financier Cecil Rhodes was a member of Illuminati. His famous trust established the Rhodes Scholarship funded by Nathan Rothschilds and designed to recruit the brightest young minds into the Illuminati, of which Bill Clinton was one. When a famous 33-degree Adept and Illuminati fellow George Bush Sr. was head of the CIA. He uh, determinedly and officially closed down the investigation into the Illuminati for all time due to lack of evidence. Uh, Dr. Carl Quigley, which I was just talking about, and by the way, you know, the CIA was not meant for the security of the American people. <laughs> That's just a tool for um, the um, Controllers who rule the rule the government, the, the, the CFR. That that's their you know that's their thing. It's, it has nothing to do with you. you know, neither does the military, for that matter. I mean, Dr. Carol Quigley, mentor of Clinton, admits Rhodes, a gold and diamond baron, formed a society of the elect in 1891 to absorb wealth and to establish world government. He formed ro the Round Table groups with help of the Fabian Society and Woodrow Wilson's, the inquiry to accomplish these goals which, as you will recall, led by the CFR, the Fabian Society, was the British-European face of, for socialism. It was funded. It was founded in 1884 by a courtier of progressive intellectuals such as Bernard Shaw and Bethsant, the successor to Blavatsky in the Theophysy Society. It further funded the English Labour Party to further its socialist agenda. Quigley maintains Rhodes scholarships are merely a facade to conceal the secret society that drafts elite minds to attain world government. And by the way, Quigley's not against these things. He's just telling you. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, let's see. 523 we're going to read. Okay, that's enough. Okay, let's go to 525. Okay. And... Um, Emphasizing the unbridled power of Rex Deuce was Woodrow Wilson, who later or, or aided three radio addresses in 1921, warning the American public of the Illuminati takeover of the U.S. banking system. He understood that there is a power so organized, so complete, and so pervasive that none had better speak above their breath when they speak in a condemnation of it. One must analyze all this global conspiracy by the evidence brought forth all these far-flung clandestine factions must be working under one umbrella organization in unison to bring about the universal spurious religion of the end times together world government. I know it's interesting. There's certain things, you know, people for the longest time, uh, you know, there's certain things you've got to whisper. You can't talk in public for the same reasons, you know, today. And um, Okay. Let's uh, look at uh, 528. Okay, and uh, 522. 
uh, the Gnostic Theophysis dogma of uh, messengers, prophets sent to uh, every generation and every people is a clever manipulation that craftily perverts the true doctrine of messengers from God Most High. These purported polytheist prophets of false gods and Satan are intermixed with authentic prophets such as Moses, Abraham, Muhammad, <laughs> and Jesus corrupting see, uh, the monotheist message of God's messengers. This intermingled design is to confuse, persuade, and ignorant, and naive in combination of polytheism, Gnosticism, and theophysy is the true religion of the world. So, um, I don't know why he thinks, see, I was saying this before, you know, he, he, he just thinks that being monotheistic automatically puts you on the right side of the, you know, on the right side of God, you know. So, excuse me, I'm going to be drinking while I do this. I'm sure you don't mind. I need a little, ouch. I need a little um, uh, wet my whistle. Ah, okay. All right, five forty-eight at three. Okay. Uh, as we discovered previously, the Bible predicts a ten-horned or ten-toed empire will resurrect out of the ashes of the old Roman Empire in the last days, which would bring about the coming of the Antichrist. Lord Maitreya, Treya, uh, this is exactly what the spurious globalist forces are endeavoring to bring about. The World Constitution and Parliament Association, a Rockefeller-sponsored foundation, includes in its vision a world divided into ten constituencies the Club of Rome has also arrogantly divided the world into ten economic and political regions. This is no coincidence. The God of Gods preordained it. Secret societies are endeavoring to recreate the Age of Enlightenment, the reincarnated antediluvian Age of Atlantis, by reestablishing antediluvian rule that reigned supreme over Atlantis. They sincerely believe the essential arts and knowledge of our present civilization trace their beginnings back to the great antediluvian empire of Atlantis through Egypt. Along with the secrets they possess, this is the Genesis 6 conspiracy destined to place the new Nimrod, the Antichrist, at the head of the world government for a thousand years of the reincarnated Fourth Reich. Well, I wouldn't call it Fourth Reich. <laughs> okay. I wish this guy, you should call it, you know, the new communist century or something like that. I, I like, though, the fact that Okay, and I think this is why my friends bought me this book. I, I think it's because he's trying to connect the motives to, you know, the motives of the, the control freaks um, to, um, you know, higher spiritual um, powers and influences, um, which is, um, I think, very appropriate. You know. Okay, so um, we're going to go ahead to 548. Oh, we just did 548. Let's go ahead to 549. <laughs> okay. The renewal of Atlantis is yet another allegory of King Arthur and the Grail legends. Excalibur, the famous sword of Arthur, symbolizes a key to Atlantis that was hidden in England. The key is the location of certain wisdom and knowledge along with additional keys to unseal the antediluvian knowledge that is to remain sealed and hidden until people that possess the right level of knowledge and wisdom are able to unlock it. The withdrawal of Excalibur represents the rebirth of the new Atlantean race, just as Camelot and uh, Arthur's reign did. Arthur's reign did. America was conceived to achieve as a global model the ideal commonwealth in this political world. As Mars notes, America is the stepping stone, the great plan to bring about new Atlantis, just as the Templars, Freemasons, Rosicrucians, and Francis Bacon's had envisioned. Okay, so that that's right. I, I agree that, that that's really what you got. All you need to know about American history and the founding of America. That's right there. And so you got to be careful before you go to war for these people, or especially if um, there's a secession movement, you've got to be careful that you pr you promote it and not uh, oppose it. Okay, 
The grafting of royal families was more than compatible for both the Norse and the mystic Essens held similar religious beliefs, even to the extent that the Norse believed that the royal families all descended back to the god Thor through his various offspring and demigods, Nephilim. In fact, Nevin Sinclair wrote in the 15th century AD that he believed Christianity had been hijacked by the Pauline cult so that proper attention was not given to Mother Earth. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this is one of the things. This is, this is my big, this is my, my, you know, big beef with, um, uh, Red Ice, you know, that, um, Thor, uh, is a product of, of the fallen angels. Is, you know, why would you worship a fallen angel? I don't get that. All right. Anyways. Although they're probably, you know, I, I mean, they seem to be, you know, Thor worshippers in name only. I mean, it's not like they um, believe that it is he's a real god. I, you know, something to that effect. All right, let's see. Um, five, six. Some believe that all the serpent allegories infesting the disparate cultures around the globe reflect an ancestral memory, where serpents and reptiles may have been the dominant species on Earth at one time. Whispering unexplained memories from ancient epics of saurian and reptile dominance over mammals in the little known age of the dinosaurs. Remember, in the age before God created Adam and the people of day six, the mammal kin to primates, known today as man, seraphim angels controlled the earth. Likely dinosaurs and other reptilian beings were the watchers privileged from life forms. Um, all this was reflected in Star Trek's Voyager's accounts of ancient in intelligent and superior race of Saurians that evolved from dinosaurs and had originally dominated the Earth before the age of the humans. Possibly a serpent-like being with intelligence similar to a human may have, um, might have been a uh, dominant species possessing kingship rights. Remember Satan's jealousy and seditious actions towards God and Adam after God created the mammal Adam to be lord of the earth. Kingship was not originally given to Adam, but it was later lowered to earth from heaven by seraphim fallen angels to the viper serpent like Nephilim. In a similar fashion, the Lord of the Rings trilogy memorializes the forgotten ancient epics and then announces that the new epic uh, and dominion of man at the former epic's denouncement with elves, fairies, trolls, and all immortal beings sailing off into the sunset of, to the other world. Um, 571, let me see. I got to uh, add that to my notes. Okay, so <clears throat> we're going on now to... Oh, boy. <laughs> I really don't think I'm going to make it. Okay, 571, 572, 574... 74. And then this is a note that I don't know if I really, it's not, I think this is meant for me discussion with my friends, but let me see basically what it's about. Oh, yeah, the, okay, this is all about, you know, renewal of earth concepts, the idea that, you know, the, the creation account in Genesis is not, is not this act of creating matter so much as is the act of restoring the earth from some chaotic condition that it was, um, something that happened to it from from fallen angels which is actually pretty interesting I um, I'm not really sure what to make of that I'm, I'm, I'm not somebody who strictly adheres to the fact that the idea that nothing was created before the Genesis account that, that or that, that the original account of Genesis the Genesis count the very beginning is the very beginning, but that then there's some kind of gap theory. Uh, you know, that's probably more of what I mean. I, I don't um, because to me, I mean, the, the creation event was like an uploading event. God was the only thing that existed before, and out of his, you know, he provided out of himself the matrix um, for the information upload. And that's and that's why you know I don't I have no problem with 
young earth creation. I have no problem with this. You know, it's, it's, you know, <laughs> it's, it's not it's it's not unscientific as far as I'm concerned. Okay, uh, forty-two, five eighty-two. Well, maybe I can finish. Five eighty-two. Oh yeah. Oh boy. Okay. Five eighty-two. I'm gonna try to force the <laughs> myself to finish this. I don't think I can. I'm, it's not gonna happen. All right. Oh, I got a phone call. Let me see. Is this is? Excuse me. Whoop. Okay. All right. Let's see. Um. Huh. Okay. Hello. Excuse me. Hello. Oh jeez. All right. Anyways, I'll have to get that later. It's my friend, um, who gave me this book. <laughs> I gotta tell him I'm making this. All right. Let's see here. Five eighty two. Okay. Job records Rahab slaying the pillars of heaven quake. Uh, aghast at his rebuke by his power, he turned up the sea by his wisdom. He cut Rahab to pieces by his breath. The skies became fair, and his hand pierced the gliding, the gliding serpent. Portions of the battle of God and Rahab have been scattered inadvertently throughout Isaiah, uh, Isaiah, Job, and Psalms, but seemingly the crushing of Rahab's skull in Psalms is directly uh, related to the separating the sky from the earth in creation myths. Bauer states that surely what cannot be coincidence is that so many creation stories begins with darkness and chaos with the watchers, um, uh, which must be split so that life might begin on dry land. Excuse me. Jake? Hey, Jake, um, listen, I'm right in the middle of recording um, a video on, um, I'm doing the, um, I'm doing the Genesis 6 conspiracy. I I put up, I did part one already, but let me call you back uh, as soon as I'm done. I'm almost done, okay? All right, thanks. All right, bye. <laughs> okay. All right. <clears throat> According to David and Margaret Lemming, Egyptian creation myths are relatively constant and the same story divided by different allegories. This includes the source of all things, the prime primeval waters and their chaotic presence. Creation myths recall the earth being formed out of the prime, uh, primeval waters of chaos, just as Vedic traditions recount creation from the beginning of the churning ocean. Chinese variants from the Shu Qing recount that God commissioned em emissaries to earth, which was blanketed with water, but were um, resisted by dragons, whereby God sent you to defeat the dragon. Jonathan Evans notes the Egyptians, Indian, Chinese, and Me uh, Mesopotamian uh, creation dragons all represent the destructive waters of chaos, the enemy of creation, gods, and order. The chaotic waters of Genesis are a constant and almost myth uh, in almost all mythologies and cultures around the world regarding that creation. Uh, the uh, Satapatha Brahmana declares that in the beginning there was only darkness and water, while the uh, Rig Veda uh, ve um, c conjures up a great dragon named Aha, Ahi, or Verta, or Verita, who strangles seven great rivers, a story that is uh, repeated throughout the Vedas. Veretta was the firstborn dragon, the dragon of the deep, known as well as uh, ah, um, Ahabudan Danya uh, in several other Vedic hymns. This dragon was slain by Indra and by his crushing the head of Veritra, just as God did in Genesis. Indra slew the dragon with heavenly ap approval of his deed on a mountain with heavenly bolts of thunder and lightning which broke uh, Veritra into pieces. Like the legend of the Near East, Norse legends feature the famous cosmic dragon, the world serpent uh, Midgard Samur <laughs> Lormungrandr which resided in the outer seas and separated order from chaos. The sea monster was destroyed by Thor striking 
the mud guard serpent to create heavens and earth. Middle Earth, featured in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings trilogy, was thereby formed between the waters and the air for humankind, which featured the world tree in the center. Tolkien leaned heavily on Norse mythology while mixing in heavy doses of Alexandria, Alantrian and Greek. Uh, let me see, 683, 583. Similarly, Ovid's metamorphosis recalls the formation of the earth from a formless chaos. Greeks recorded that before the beginning there was chaos whereby the elements were separated into air which rose up and earth which sunk and floated in primordial waters. Um, here's the Genesis account. Uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse to separate the water from under the expanse from the water above it. And it was so. God called the expanse sky and God said, let the water under the sky be gathered into one place and let the dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land and gathered the water as he called the, the sea. Uh, Pantheist legends are identical recountings of scriptural creation. Almost identical, I should say. Genesis has exacting details with perfect chronology. First cosmos was created by God. This was done within the surrounding chaotic waters of the universe. Just as Genesis states, there should be an expanse between water separating water under the expanse and water from above the expanse, the surrounding chaotic water. Then God separated the sky, not from the earth, Geb, creating order and thus creating the land, primeval, land, primeval mound, Middle Earth. In 1908, Nikola Tesla identified ether as the water of the obscure expanse, the water above. He noted this ether was a tenuous fluid filling all space with a spinning motion similar to the whirl in water in a calm lake. Once in motion, this water becomes matter, but when still, it reverts back to its normal state. Ether, ether was thought of in Greek mythology as the essence of space, while um, Aristotle and Pythagoras identified ether as the fifth element. Newton described ether as an invisible substance, uh, invisible substance permeating the universe like a living spirit. Einstein concluded ether is necessary for the laws of physics to exist, and that without ether there would be no light, no space, and no time. Um, chalk another point up for the accuracy of scriptures. Well, Einstein didn't, <laughs> I mean, Einstein actually could, sort of got rid of the ether. That was the whole point. Not that he actually succeeded, but I mean, that was, you know, that was a big part of of the um, implications of, of relativity. Place all this alongside Babylonian Canaanite mythologies of Baal, Marduk, slaying the seven-headed sea dragons, Chaos, Tiamat, Loton, Yam, Baal, Marduk, cut um, Tiamat, Loton, Yam into the pieces, fashioning one into sky, another into earth, and you can see how all versions are the same uncanny narrative, biblical descriptions of the spirit hovering over the water, and God slaying the Leviathan of the chaotic sea, ne uh, neatly fused together in the same narrative. Now recall th that Reed notes, dragons were regarded as the same as cherubs, centaurs, griffins, sphinxes, understanding that all cherubs, the terrible gargoyles portrayed in Gothic cathedrals, were also dragons of antiquity representing fallen angels. Flying dragons were, in all likelihood, a different form of prehistoric serpent in the spirit of their kin, the falling angels, while flying dragons of biblical record were seraphim angels. These fallen an gods were carved without explanation into the cathedrals by the Essen descendants. Hence, one of the wonders one then wonders was the rebellion at the renewal of the earth, the great angelic rebellion. That's kind of interesting. Oh, I'm going to quit because I can't make it in time. <laughs> I'm running out of time. I got remember I got to I got to keep my videos down below two hours. I got too much to do. I'm not going to finish it in 20 minutes. Um, so we'll have a part three, I suppose. I'll put this one up next on um, YouTube and um, library. R B L L B R Y, um, which is where I'm going to go with all my material if I get kicked off YouTube. <laughs> so, all right, um, I'll see you next time. Hopefully soon. I got to finish this.